Good evening and welcome. If you are ready to take a seat and start learning about our comprehensive an annual financial report. Um, my name is Jeanette Magnosi. I want to welcome you to this workshop. Um, this is actually a pretty good turnout for us for our very first workshop. We have a few more planned, so we hope that you are um, a recurring uh, guest for these workshops. We hope to include more, and before the evening's up, we'll send around a survey for you so you can give us some feedback on this workshop and what you'd like to see in the future. But before we get started, I wanted to ask a couple of questions. So I'm, you know, I've been a teacher in the past, so I, I tend to try to get you all involved, but I won't call on anyone specifically. But um, I did want to ask, well, first of all, I wanted to uh, introduce our council members who are here tonight. We have our Mayor Pro Tem, Janice Elliott, we have <laughs> Council Member Rudy Zuniga, <laughs> Council Member Bill Elliott, I mean, excuse me, Bill Bill, sorry, no relation. Sorry about that. I was already moving ahead, my apologies. Um, you no longer know my last name. And we have our speaker here tonight, who I'll introduce in just a moment. We also have our city's finance officer, Wanda Helms, Wanda Bach Helms in the back. So, um, and we also have um, our analyst for public works, who's brought all kinds of, uh, Michelle has brought all kinds of flyers about upcoming public works workshops and opportunities for water conservation um, opportunities for you. So there's all kinds of flyers back there. We also have some goodies, so make yourself comfortable. Um, for those of you who haven't been in this building before, we do have restrooms. Uh, if you need to use them, please feel free. They're right outside and to your right when you exit the doorway right here. Okay, so let me ask you, what, would you, what, what are you hoping to learn tonight? What do you want to take away from this workshop? How to rate this. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. That's a good start. A clear yes. financial condition of the city. A clear financial condition of the city. Okay. We kind of nice to know how, like, compared to like a regular uh, balance sheet or profit and loss, like a regular business has, how is the city kind of different? Okay. Yeah. Anybody else? Anything specific you're hoping to find? Well, our goal is to teach you about how to find the information that you need to find in the in the document for you to understand what drives what's in the document and how it's uh, assembled and what information that you can find in the document. Um, our speaker tonight will not be giving like opinion on whether the city is doing something right or wrong, but it's really about how to read the document so you can determine that for yourself. Um, so hopefully you'll find this beneficial. So I'd like to introduce our speaker tonight. Um, Brett Van Lant is uh, a partner in um, Van Lant and Finkano, and uh, they have audited the city for the first time this year. Uh, we went out to bid, and our goal was to find uh, the strongest auditor that we could find who would keep us accountable and who would um, maybe give us suggestions of how we can do things better, but also to really scrutinize our books. And I will tell you, that they were really thorough, they were very, very, paid a lot of attention to detail, and I know that our staff spent a lot of time gathering information for them as well. So they were well worth, uh, well worth uh, what we paid them to do, and it was a big undertaking to take over a new city this year, especially one with, um, you know, some complicated history. So uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Brett, and he's gonna take it from here. All right, uh, good evening everybody. Uh, my name is Brett Van Lance. I'm a partner with Van Lance and Fan Kennel. Um, the city uh, management has asked me to kind of give a brief overview of the CAFR and uh, kind of talk about the information, uh, how, it, how it's derived and how it ends up in the CAFR. Um, I would uh, kind of just try to keep it very uh, informal. If you guys have questions as I go, stop me up try to answer them as best I can. Um, kind of my first time doing a big uh, uh, workshop, so bear with me as I, as I go through it. So we'll start out uh, just kind of going through uh, what is a CAFR? Uh, obviously it's a comprehensive annual financial report. Um, it includes uh, the management's discussion and analysis, which is the MD&A, the audit report, 
the basic financial statements. It has uh, required supplementary information and also the supplementary information. And there are other parts to this CAFR uh, that might might be useful to some you know statistical section things like that. But um, I'm going to kind of focus on these ones because these are the kind of the guts of the financial statements that have the most most meaning. Uh, and, and again, all of this is coming from an auditor's perspective, so just keep that in mind. Who are the users of the CAFR? Who, who actually takes this information and uses it to uh, make decisions or decide whether they're going to invest in the city or things like that? And so uh, the users of the CAFR, management, city council, uh, the citizens, residents of the city, bondholders, uh, employees and retirees, uh, grantors, they are actually uh, using your CAFR to make decisions, uh, review it, have questions, things like that. So that's, these are the users of your uh, financial statements. And, and when I say CAFR, you can interchange it with audited financial statements. That's kind of the, the main, uh, main thing that a CAFR actually is. Uh, when is the CAFR prepared? The city's fiscal year end is June 30, and so typically within a six month period is when uh, a majority of financial statements are issued. It doesn't always work out that way. Sometimes it's January, sometimes it's February, sometimes it's March. I have had some clients where it's all the way till uh, October of the following year, so uh, th those aren't the, the best uh, finance departments, but when it goes that long, but uh, it, it does happen. There's a lot of information that goes into the financial statement and for an auditor to actually sign off and issue an audit opinion, it's uh, it's all gotta be in there or we, we won't sign off on it. So. Um, so where does the information in the CAFR come from? Well, a majority of it all comes from the city's accounting records which is the general ledger. That's the accumulation of all the activity that takes place throughout the year, all the checks that are issued, all the payments that are received, all the balances uh, for cash and receivables, things like that. That's all accounted for on a daily basis and then a uh, monthly basis and also on an annual basis for certain balances. So that's where a majority of the information comes from for the actual financial statements themselves. Uh, some of the information for bonds obviously comes from the actual bond documents themselves. Uh, your municipal code regarding some of the note disclosures in your financial statements. Resolutions adopted by city council that talks about some of the uh, different disclosures in your financial statements as well. Uh, capital asset schedules that uh, finance department maintains and also actuaries, CalPERS, and then hired actuaries for your uh, post-employment post benefits, the uh, net, net OPEB liabilities, things like that, that's coming from actuaries. So why do you need a CAFR? Uh, well, it's, uh, it's intended for the users of your financial statements, and it's also required if you have federal expenditures that exceed $750,000, or if you have municipal bond debt, and also it's typically required by your own ordinances. So there's, uh, there are government agencies that may, they may not be required if they don't have uh, any of these uh, requirements to actually have a, a financial statement. So we'll talk about kind of the formatting of your financial statements and where, where that information comes from in order to actually uh, present it the way it's presented, uh, or it was just your... What's, what is the... I'm sorry, it's uh, other post-employment benefits, which for the city is basically the benefits that have been promised for uh, retirees for health insurance. That's, that's the biggest one. And it's, uh, it's a liability for the current retirees and also employees that have accrued or, or are estimated to get a benefit. So that, that's what the OPEP is. Uh, GFOA, which is the Government Finance Officers Association, they're the ones that uh, the city would be uh, sending this financial statement to to receive uh, the award for 
uh, excellence in financial reporting. I know they've received it for, I don't know the, the, the history on it, but I know it's been many, many years that they've received the, the award for submitting for the CAF or so. Um, the GFOA is also a good uh, resource for providing best practices for governmental accounting and also for financial reporting. And so it's also a resource that uh, the city uses and us, us as auditors, we use it uh, regularly. In, in addition to the, the GASB statements, I'm not a walking encyclopedia, but um, you know, having, having access to GASB statements um, to make sure that uh, every year that your financial statements are following the proper standards for financial reporting. So earlier we uh, kind of mentioned the uh, management's discussion and analysis, and that, that begins on, I believe, page four of the, of the CAFR itself. And this is a, a part of what's, what's called required supplementary information. It's required as a part of, uh, to supplement the basic financial statements. And the information in your management management discussion and analysis is uh, all required information by the accounting standards. Probably one of the most useful um, areas for, for readers to, when they're looking at your financial statements, it's not a comparative financial statement when you get to the basic financial statements. You might not know, well, our revenues are 40 million, is that good? Well, what were they last year? Did they go up, did they go down? Are we moving in the right direction? So this is kind of a good um, starting point to kind of see, well, did, we, did our fund balance increase or did our fund balance decrease? Did our expenditures go up, did they go down? This is kind of where you would start um, to start analyzing your financial statements. Um, again, it, the, the MD&A is focusing on the governmental activities, the business type activities, and major funds. And I'll kind of get into major funds in just, just a minute. But um, So it, it's going to focus uh, kind of on a summary level, the, the main funds of your financial statements, and not, not all the smaller funds that are in the back. So uh, page, sorry, I should have had it mapped down here, but page 11, uh, that's, that's the start of what is your government-wide financial statements. This is kind of a very high-level summary uh, of the, the city as a whole. So you have your, your first column there that's governmental activities, and then you have the, the business-type activities. So the, the governmental activities is all of the non, uh, basically it doesn't include water, sewer, or solid waste. So that's the, that's the uh, government as a whole not including those funds. And this is uh, full accrual accounting, so you'll see all of your long-term debt, all of your capital assets, all re reported here, and you won't see that. Um, as you get into the governmental funds. So you look at you look at your financial statements here and you see on, on page 12 with under the, or I'm sorry, 11, sorry. <laughs> under your governmental activities you have 355 million in total assets. Uh, but if you look, the two numbers above it, roughly 280, 285 million is made up of capital assets. This is uh, money that basically you can't spend. Um, goes down and then you have down below your net position and you can kind of see that 262 million is uh, investment in capital assets. So you have you have a net position of 221 million as a, as a city as a whole in, in your governmental funds. So how do you read that? Well, 200, 262 million of it is a net investment in capital assets, and then you see this uh, very large negative unrestricted net position. What page? I'm sorry, page 11. Yes. So what are the enterprise funds not included in this? They actually are included, they're just in the column next to it. So it's a business type activity, governmental activity. So 
Um, the governmental activities is all non-enterprise yeah. funds. Okay. Um, so you see, you have an unrestricted net position of 83 million. Is that good? Is that bad? Well, it's not great, but it's not uncommon for a government to have a negative unrestricted net position, especially with the pension liabilities. This is all stuff that was just <coughs> recently added to your financial statements within the last five years. So five years ago, you back out your uh, $99 million net pension liability and your net OPEB liability. Well, now we have a we have a positive unrestricted net position. But you never really did. You had these liabilities, they were always there. Um, the new accounting standards are now just bringing them onto the face of your financial statements. So, and then the, the business type activities is actually pretty simple because it's basically a, a accumulation of the uh, enterprise funds and there's really no change in the reporting standards. It's all full accrual already, so there's no, there's no real changes as you go from the enterprise funds to the business type activities, just the accumulation of those. Uh, governmental fund financial statements, this is where uh, the a majority of a lot of the focus takes place. Uh, obviously the general fund, uh, this is gonna start on page 14, for those of you following the financial statements. Um, so the, the governmental fund financial statements are going to include your general funds, special revenue funds, capital projects funds, all of these funds. Uh, so and then on the, on the face of them, you'll have your general fund, any major funds, and then a total of your non-major funds. The way major funds uh, end up being reported on your financial statements is a it was two things. It could be management's discretion. Management might decide, you know what, this fund, we want it to be reported on, on this uh, on, as a major fund. Or it's a formula. Yes? Question. Um, is there a digital format within TAP metadata from, from this file that you're providing? Yes, can you say that again? Is there a digital file that we may access with integral metadata from the document? There's a PDF. There's a PDF? Yeah. Yeah. It's on the city's website. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so a major fund is presented if it meets a certain uh, threshold. It has to be uh, at least in, in any category of revenues, expenditures, assets, or liabilities, it has to be at least 10% of the total of uh, the governmental funds and also 5% of the entire uh, enterprise funds, uh, governmental funds combined. So if any of the categories of assets exceed that percentage, then it has to be reported as a major fund. A uh, couple things to, to look at um, that, that, you know, looking at your, your general fund, you know, what, uh, are, we, are we doing good, are we doing bad? Where you want to focus is probably in your, uh, your fund balance, you know, and comparing it to one year to the next. Is our fund balance increasing? Is it decreasing? Uh, what are the reasons for it? It's increasing and decreasing, um, as well as as well as the uh, income statement, which is on page 16. Looking at looking at that, are we are we uh, is our fund balance increasing or decreasing? Is you know what are the reasons for that? Um, the, the unique thing about a, a, a government is that it's not a business, you know, especially the general fund. The general fund is not in, in the business of making money. It's collecting taxes and hopefully going to have collect enough to pay for all of the uh, services that are trying to be provided. And in, in a government, you can look at it from, you know, I kind of look at it from two perspectives. Uh, are we building up a bunch of fund balance? Well, that's great, but are we providing the services to our citizens? So um, you could look at a city that has a, a huge fund balance. Well, that's great, but now you have a bunch of money sitting there that you didn't spend and you didn't provide services to your citizens. So there's kind of two, uh, two ways to look at it. Um, when, when assessing the, the fund balance of a general fund uh, specifically, you kind of look at um, 
anything that would be considered unrestricted. And, and even though unassigned is obviously unrestricted, committed could potentially be unrestricted as well. It's been committed by, um, by city council, uh, through resolutions, things like that. So they've actually committed it for their for specific purposes, but it's not restricted from outside entities. So um, when you look at your your unrestricted net position, uh, you got about 13 million, 14 million, which is uh, a little less than 50 percent of your total expenditures for the year. So that's that's actually pretty good. The GFOA recommended. Um, uh, minimum fund balance is two months worth of operating expenditures. So if, if you look at it from that pr perspective, you got probably at least five months worth of operating expenditures. Um, that's kind of, that's like a GFOA best practice, you know, reserves for your general fund having a unrestricted net, net fund balance. Uh, the rest is kind of self-explanatory uh, as far as you have your special revenue housing fund. The non-major governmental fund is an accumulation from the supplementary information, which begins on page 65. Yeah, 65. So that, that total non-major fund that you saw uh, in, in the on the uh, governmental funds is an accumulation of all of these funds uh, beginning on page 65 which crosses all the way over to uh, page 68 so those totals um, are brought forward and that's now just a, a, uh, a fund in your financial statements as a total so these this is where you have uh, different uh, special revenue funds these are funds that are restricted for specific purposes uh, you have your gas tax fund, uh, home program, you know, several different funds. And these, the, they're special revenue funds for the purpose that the money that you receive uh, through gas tax is restricted. It can't be used for anything other than what's required by gas tax. Streets, roads, things like that. It can't be used for, um, you know, any other purpose other than those. Uh, same with all of these other um, special revenue funds, they all have specific purposes and, and typically they're, they're smaller, which is why they're not, they're considered non-major. Yes. If the fund is not used up completely, does that affect, uh, does that, does that affect the following year's funding or is it already set in stone? Every year you receive this amount. Um, yeah. For instance, gas tax, it would just depend on... Um, usage, right? Well, your usage is, is not... Is not it, it, the amount that the city receives right. depends on how, how much gas tax is sold, or you know, how right. much purchases, things so like, like that. Air Quality Management District? Uh, air Quality Management District, I would have to <coughs> check exactly how that... Those, sometimes those can be um, grants right. that, that are applied for. It's not just a set amount every year. A portion of it could be a set amount, but um, other portions could be. <coughs> and and you know when you when you're assessing some of the special revenue funds, if you're if you're you know bored and you just want to go through the, the some of these uh, non-major funds, if you're looking at uh, a grant fund from one year to the next and the revenues went way down, well they didn't get a grant. You know there's a good chance that they didn't maybe they didn't apply for a grant. And but they didn't get the grant. So these ones fluctuate from year to year. Uh, sometimes in a given year, due to the activity in one of these, it might now become major because they have uh, a huge revenue source that came in for a big project, so now it's, it's being reported as a major fund. One year, following year, it goes back to a non-major fund. So it, it, it will fluctuate. One thing I wanted to point out with the governmental funds also, these are considered modified accrual financial statements. So what does that mean? That's basically, it's supposed to be close to cash. So um, 
you don't have you don't have long-term assets. You don't have capital assets reported in here. You don't have long-term debt. Long-term debt uh, for financial reporting purposes includes claims, liabilities, compensated absences, uh, vac you know, vacation payable, things like that, uh, net pension liability. So you won't see that reported in these governmental funds because of the, the modified accrual basis that these are required to be reported in. With that, you don't see the capital assets either. And so um, I know somebody had a question or, or wanted to find out about you know, what's the difference between uh, business, business type accounting and, and governmental accounting. That's probably one of, the, one of the bigger differences is when you have an expense for a capital asset in a business, you capitalize it. So you don't actually show an expense, you show an asset. In a governmental fund, you'll have a, a big expense for an asset that eventually will get capitalized when it goes to the government wide financial statements. But in here in the modified accrual, you actually show the expenditure. Same with the repayment of debt. Um, in, in a fund financial statement, the actual payment for principal is an expense. An expense. <coughs> in a business, uh, if you repay principal, if you're repaying debt, it's just a reduction of the liability as opposed to an actual expense to your business. Any more questions on governmental funds? So then you move to page uh, 18. Oh, sorry, real quick. I'll just kind of brief over this. But uh, pages 15 and 17 are, are reconciliation pages. These are basically taking your governmental fund financial statements from the modified accrual basis and converting them to the full accrual basis. So it's adding in the capital assets, it's adding in all the debt, it's adding in all of that to then be the entity-wide governmental financial statements. So those, those reconciliation pages are just showing how it goes from um, your fund financial statements, which are modified accrual, to uh, your entity-wide financial statements, which are full accrual. Then we get to page 18, which is your proprietary funds. Proprietary funds are made up of uh, enterprise funds and internal service funds. So your, your enterprise funds are obviously your water, solid waste, sewer funds. And these are also, uh, the internal service funds are recorded um, in total. So all of the different uh, smaller internal service funds are are required to only be reported as one fund in your uh, basic financial statements. Um, full accrual accounting for both of these, and it includes all of your capital assets, any, any amounts that have been allocated to these funds for net pension liability, uh, your uh, net OPEB liability, things like that. And then you have uh, income statement for the for the enterprise funds, internal service funds. Um, if you have any specific questions on those, go ahead. But um, these are these are very much their their business type, which means they're very much accounted for like a business. It's a it's it's a uh, charges based fund, so they have services that they're providing similar to a business where they are compensated for it. So then you have the, the most enjoyable section of the financial statements, which are the, the many note disclosures. Excuse me. Yes. On that last page you're looking at, page 18. Yes. That in the total column at the end of the page is a negative cash position. What was the question? On uh, page 18, uh, in the, uh, I'm sorry, that's the governmental activities. Okay, I, I, did, I just read that column. Okay. But, but the net position, <coughs> those are, which column tells us the uh, most accurate cash position? Cash? Cash is going to be up at the top in your assets. 
So the very first line of each of those funds has uh, cash and investments. So you can actually see the cash balance in each fund. And then there's also, uh, some of them have some small restricted cash balances. But so the, so the detail of each is, is in, in there, so. Okay. Alright, back to the fun stuff. So your, uh, your notes, which, which makes up uh, a majority of your audited financial statements, is... I'm sorry? The, all, all the note disclosures, as I mentioned before, are required by GASB. Uh, GASB issues the statements that are required to be presented, so they're very uniform. Uh, if, you, if you pick up another financial statement, it, it will probably look very similar as far as what note disclosures are in your financial statements. They might be in different, um, different spots, different note numbers, but uh, overall, the the these ones that I listed here are, are probably, you're going to find them in every CAFR you find. GASB uh, takes the stance that a, a note disclosure is required if it's material. So it goes through all the different uh, accounting policies of the city, uh, different how is uh, inventory accounted for, how are capital assets accounted for, um, pensions, uh, talks about some of your major funds. And so this is kind of just a very summary level information about the different uh, categories of your financial statements and, and how they're accounted for. Uh, one, one of the notes in here will talk about your deferred outflows and deferred inflows of resources. And anybody that uh, has a business or, or has worked with accounting before knows that it's uh, assets, liabilities equals equity. Well, not in, uh, not in governmental accounting. The GASB invented uh, deferred inflows and deferred outflows. And so that, that kind of talks about what these are, but mainly for, for the city, it's just related to uh, your pension liabilities and your OPEB, and it has to do with the timing of when things are accounted for. So you'll see a big number in there, and um, it will be uh, a big number for, I believe it's uh, deferred outflows on, on the governmental activities. And you say, well, what is that? And it's 19 million of deferred outflows. Well, GASB basically invented it, and it, it's going to either, it's going to be expensed in the future based on future estimates by actuaries. So don't, don't, don't put a whole lot of, um, of weight into those numbers for deferred inflows and outflows because they are, they are based on estimates going forward. Does that account for future projects or the time it would take to pay for future projects? So the deferred inflows and outflows on your government-wide financial statements, and let me just double check that real quick so I know what I'm It's on page 12. Um, it has pension related items. The, the total is 20, 21 million in deferred outflows for pensions. The note disclosures will give you kind of the detail of it, but basically it has to do with the timing of the pension reporting. So the pensions are accounted for a year in, in, in arrears. It's on page so, Oh, I'm sorry, I paid on it. I keep that uh, so, so, any payments that were made in 2018 towards your pension liability is deferred until the following year because the liability is actually measured as of 2017. So, Very confusing, but the reason is because uh, actuaries have to calculate all this information, CalPERS has to do it for hundreds, maybe probably thousands of agencies in the state. And they do it a year, uh, they account for it a year behind so that you have the information ready and available to be used in your financial statements the following year. And it's all uh, GASB, GASB 68, which covers this uh, accounting standards, 
um, allows for, I believe you can actually do it up to two years in arrears, if I'm not mistaken, but um, CalPERS always does it for uh, one year in arrears. So all deferred expenditures are always going to be in conjunction with a, like a pension? The, these ones, pension related items, yes, but they're also, they're, they're, they're also uh, differences in calculations by actuary. So an actuary will do an estimate of what they expect the uh, investments for pensions to earn, and they will base decisions based on that. Then the following year, they will reanalyze that and adjust it going forward, and then they defer it. And then they will uh, amortize it over a, a several year period. So that number is always changing, but within there um, is an amount for the contributions that were made in the 2018 fiscal year. Now those amounts were expensed in your fund financial statements. So whatever the city paid for pensions was included in the general fund, um, any of the other funds. When you go to the full accrual, that's when it gets um, uh, put into uh, uh, deferred outflow, but then the previous years comes in as an expense. So it kind of washes out for the most part. I didn't write the standards. Um, I, I, I have a feeling if if, uh, if they would have made it a little simpler, it would have been just as much information that you already have. But, yes. Does, is that pension related? Is that percent? Does the actuary use a percentage per year? For, for what, I'm sorry. For the actual, for the pinch related items, the amount. The so, tools that you have to set aside, the deferred outflows, is that? Yeah, uh, just, we'll, we'll jump into the notes here because there is there is an actual note disclosure that um, provides the detail for this, of what, what that's made up of. Uh, page 49 of your half, or kind of the middle of the page, it has, uh, deferred outflows of resources and deferred inflows. And so you can see the total 21 million there, which which agrees to the, the uh, financial statement that we're looking at. So you can see the pension contributions subsequent to the measurement date. That's the 7.6 7 million. That's the amount I was referring to. That's, um, those are the amounts that were paid this year, but will be recognized last uh, next year, sorry. Changes of assum changes in assumptions. These are changes in assumptions by the actuary. Some of it could be because of the changes in um, uh, life expected life expectancy of retirees, future retirees, things like that. That will have an impact on um, their estimates. But then they don't want to show that full amount to impact in one year, so they amortize it over several years because it's always changing. I know I'm not, I'm not doing a great job explaining that, but um, I'm not an actuary either, so it's... <laughs> well, it would be fair though to think it's percentage increase per year, then, right? It's not, it's not gonna be based on a percentage. It's gonna be based on um, changes in mortality rates, changes in investment rates of return compared to actual rates of return based on estimates. Uh, there's, there's a whole lot of stuff that goes into that, those amounts. And they, it's not a. That was my understanding that the pension plan is guaranteed a certain return. Not a return. Is that right? A payout. The defined benefit. Defined benefit. They know what they're going to get, and so the actuaries have to figure out how much you have to put in today to get that benefit in the future. So it's a defined benefit plan. Right. And so they have to say, okay, you have 300 employees and. Some are 20, some are 50. The average retirement date is this. They would have paid in for this long. And there is all estimates of a bunch of different things. And they crunch all these numbers to come up with what they say the cost is going to be and how much we need to contribute to meet our our debt <coughs> in those future years. And it, it's, it's not a percentage. It's, it's so, so CalPERS will estimate uh, what their it's called the discount rate what they expect to earn and it's a long-term rate of return and currently they have it at 7.15 percent so it's like somehow this percentage is being brought into this. right but that that's the expected rate of return on the actual investments that calipers is holding okay. and so from one year to the next they might earn 
eight and a half percent or they might earn five and a half percent and so based on that from one year to the next they have to adjust uh, when they determine what your what your pension liability is they do it assuming that you're going to earn 7.15 percent but you may only earn 6.15 percent so now your liability went up even though you paid what you were supposed to pay your liability went up because their investments didn't earn what they were supposed you to. You could actually drop 4%, 3%. Yeah, if it went down, I mean, and then it, we it did we, several years ago. And, 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 and yeah, so then our liability increases. Yes. Right. Yeah. But in the old days, like in 2002, a city that I worked for, that was the tech bubble where earnings were through the roof. The cities in 2002 didn't have to pay anything because they were super fun. Right. But then the next yeah, year, the market tanked and the city that I worked for, for PD, for every $100 a person earned, the city for their PERS percentage had to pay $54.50. So that is a huge, especially when their public safety was $75 million a year, that was a ton of money that all of a sudden the city owed. And since then, PERS has learned and instead of hitting you all at once, they're smoothing. And they're smoothing, so this amortization is, instead of hitting us, all at once in one year for that four percent rather than the seven and a half percent we were expecting they're allowing us four years to to make that up but then if it happens in the other direction they're not saying okay this year you can give us two million less because you made two million more than we thought they're going to smooth it to offset the other because there's multiple items that that have to be amortized that they estimated that didn't come to fruition and so they're smoothing things for us so that we don't get killed so, at so once. So when I get asked questions that say, if our pension, if our deferred outflow per, per pension related items last year was lower or was it, is it the same? Was it lower in 2016? Was it lower in 2015? Are we seeing a gradual in, increase for the city? Well, that's a um, question I get a lot. Our, for, for the deferred outflows? Yeah. I, I wouldn't focus on that. I would focus on the actual pension liability. Yes. Yeah, which brings me to page 48, the very far right column. Yes. You've got two types. <coughs> You've got your miscellaneous plan, and then in the middle you see safety plan. Yes. And if you look at the very bottom line on each in the far right corner, we have 40 million and 72 million. Can you explain what those two numbers signify yes so these are what are considered your net pension liability for uh, miscellaneous and then for safety and so if you look to your left uh, two columns over you have what an actuary determines is your total pension liability this is what what they have de determined that you owe for pensions and you have what's considered your fiduciary net position. This is actual assets that are held by CalPERS for to pay those benefits. The net is obviously the, the, the difference, right? What, what's left over is you still owe, and this is an actuary saying, what your current liability is to pay those benefits for future retirees, current retirees, until they hit the mortality rate, right, where they are no longer collecting benefits, this is what you would owe. It's an estimate. And, and what I like to point out uh, is if you look on the next page over, page 49, the, the first table there, this estimate, uh, the 40 million and the 70, roughly 72 million, is if CalPERS meets their mark at 7.15% for however long they're expecting to uh, re, you know, earn these benefits. If they earn 8.15%, if you look just below, you can see where the uh, discount rate has a 1% increase, your liability goes down millions of dollars. So it goes from 40 million for your miscellaneous to 26 million. And that's, this is just based on a 1% change in their estimate. Same with uh, safety, it goes from 71 million to 48 million. So these are huge differences, and these are huge estimates. If they don't earn, right, what they expect, look what your liability jumps up to. 
from 40 million to 56 million, from 71 million to 100 million. So it's not a perfect system, right? It's an, it's an actuary. They, they're, they're doing their best to determine what is our liability. The market could go crazy and you could earn 15% and you could be super funded in five years. You, you know, and that happened. But what you're, what you're going to see with, net pen, or with your pension liabilities, it's gonna go up for the next several years and your contributions are going to go up for the next several years. There will be a point in time, and I don't know when that is. I know some actuaries have done some work on, well, when is it going to level off with all the changes that they've made uh, in 2013 for uh, PEPRA, which is the, it was basically the change in, in new employees and what benefits that they would uh, get through CalPERS. And the, the benefit has been reduced, so you know, instead of 3% or 3.5%, they're getting 2% at 62 as opposed to 50 or 55. So at some point, it's going gonna, it's gonna to level off, but uh, it, it hasn't and it probably won't for many years. Um, while it was just implemented five years ago, I believe, 2013. And so uh, you guys are not the only city that are having your pension liabilities and also your actual pension contributions increasing significantly from one year to the next. Question. Yes. Talk about liability. Huh? To like reduce them, perhaps like to get the numbers back up on the board, like for them to make sense. Mm -hmm. I would say something adequate for the situation. And into, I mean, breaking them down, they're not really broken down. I mean, um, trending talks from the like, municipality, it's like, Negative equity translated to what is on liabilities on legal support houses, not much static, a bunch of factors and contributing to the government shutdown, and which is a lot of walking in the fraud scheme, car house, where the city hired doing bad business, they hired and <coughs> not to mention names, principles, all common cases. Liabilities just right now for each one false arrests, false arrests goes up. And most likely, it's a small price like one million. So here on, 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 on equity and all that stuff is going down. It's not really broken down. For, for um, I, I believe you're talking about. Would you repeat I, the question? Yeah, I, I, I think he's asking about uh, claims. Are you talking about claims against the city, like claims liabilities? Is that what you're referring right. to? Right. So for instance, losses across Kansas City, they were frozen into liabilities. False press, they were they're they're reflected into false press. There's nothing here like broken down. And for instance, like like that's what I said of um, eight, 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 eight hundred fifty k times three. So like maybe numbers make sense. And each false press, false press. Is false something we're going after? Yeah. What's your question? Like, my, my, pardon? I, I, what's your well, let me let me just. Uh, I, I think he's asking about claims liabilities and how why they're not showing up uh, individually in your financial statements. Like what? What, what claims, uh, what false arrests, things like that, how that's impacting your financial statements? Just li living example, okay, my question is this. If the liabilities are broken down and the report are so out of our properties, Yeah, you, well, well, sorry, your, your liabilities are broken down between different categories, accounts payable, um, interest payable, vacations payable, long-term debt, things like that. Uh, claims payable, and that's going to be broken down in each in each balance sheet. It's not going to be broken down uh, to indicate who you're paying it. That'd be uh, too much detail to report in your financial statements. What this is very much like fraud by insufficient info. I'm sorry. If, it's, if you say it's too much info, it'll be fraud by insufficient information. For, do you say fraud by insufficient? No, no. Uh, so your financial statements are summary information of your financial this report. Is not from the, the, this, is not full this is not a general ledger. This is not a list of checks that are issued. Where can we find that information? Uh, you have to. Okay. Uh, you, you probably have to contact. Go through the city clerk. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah, what's driving it? What, what's driving it again? Uh, the, in, the, the increase of liabilities and costs. Yeah, it would be people are living longer. They're not earning the investments that they expected to earn. Uh, 
benefits are, are uh, you know, benefits are high. People are, if people, somebody can retire at 50, 55, when they were living till 65, 70, and now they're living till 85, 90, and it's a guaranteed benefit. Um, they were expected to pay it over 15 years, now they're paying uh, triple, you know, what they expected to pay. So as people live longer, it's great, advances in medicine, but it's causing your pension liabilities to go up. That's, that's kind of a summary. Yeah, and uh, if you go from uh, almost any uh, municipality that is part of CalPERS, the benefits are very close to being the same. So uh, years ago, many, many people or many agencies kind of just adopted the same benefits and they followed the state. So if you want to blame, blame the state. Uh, the ones are pretty much self-explanatory as far as uh, the information in them if you, if you go through them. Uh, budget versus actual, this is your required supplementary information. This is what, uh, it's, a, it's a part that's required uh, for basic financial reporting. And you are required to show a budget to actual report for all, for your general fund and any major special revenue funds. Can you hear this page? Oh. <laughs> it's uh, page 56. Page 56 has your. Okay. Talk loud. All right, here we go. Okay. So. So you have on, on this uh, page 56, which is the general fund, it's a budget to actual report. You have an actual column. This will tie to your uh, governmental funds page where we were talking about the uh, general fund, major funds. And it, it, it's your original budget, your final budget based on any amendments that were made throughout the year. And then it has the actual amounts. And then it would have, uh, you know, the difference. And, um, positive, negative variances. So um, it, it, it kind of uh, assesses how did you do compared to what you budgeted. I have a question on that. I'm noticing that it says property taxes, the variances are, are negative. So at a time when our property values are actually going up, does that have anything to do with the statement? Was it on page 11 about, um, was it page 11? I can't remember what page it was that I've read briefly that talked about how actually the citizens have saved money on the amount of property taxes they paid because of the fire annexation. Is that what's related to this? So I, I believe the, the variance, or I think you're talking about the property tax of the 1.2 million variance. This, this has to do with page the- Page seven, sorry, page seven. Property um, taxes decreased by 4.2 million or 20.2% from the prior year primarily due to fire department's annexation to the San Diego County Fire District. Is that why we're losing? We bought the, the drop? Well, no, well, the, the city budgeted for that. Okay. So so the budget, um, the city budgeted for the decrease in, in revenues for, for the an annexation. The difference here, it has to do with the timing of when the city received the, the, the county, I believe took a portion of the RPTTF money that they were <laughs> not supposed to take no. so right so that's why you have this um, def or it's showing that you have a uh, you didn't collect as much as you budgeted I think it was about 1.1 million something like yeah. that so so really you know the budgeted to the actual and it has to do with the timing so the, the city didn't actually receive the money until January still oh you still haven't received it <laughs> The, 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 count, the county um, took a portion uh, that they were not supposed to take, gotcha. and um, they've all since agreed that they were not supposed to take okay. it, so they're going to pay it back. Um, but due to the uh, timing and, and because of its modified accrual, you haven't received it within 60 days, it's not shown in that number. Okay. So 
They, they will get it, it's just not, not in there this year. So is there any place that you can find the variance explanations? Uh, variance explanations, if they're, if they're big, it should, it, there should be some sort of uh, explanation in the, in the MDNA. But um, again, it, it might not be as, as detailed as you, you know, as you would expect because it's kind of summer, summary information. And again, a budget is not, um, it's, a, it's a guess. It's an, it's an educated, obviously, best estimate on, on what, what they expect to receive. So there, there won't be anything, and, and the reason is is because um, there won't be anything in here. Does the town keep some explanation on the website or anything about it to explain budget variances? You, you'd have to ask. I'm just curious. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, no. Start with the MDNA. Right. <laughs> and if it's not in there, then you can you can ask and we can do the research. Uh, Uh, and then you have the, the housing fund, which is a <coughs> major special revenue fund. Then you have some of these uh, budget schedules, uh, required supplementary information that has um, you know, several years worth of uh, different budget act or uh, uh, pension activity. If you have any questions on that, I can go through it, but it's, it's a lot of detail. Uh, then uh, OPEB. As well, OPEB. This is a, a new schedule this year due to the implementation, and uh, it, it talks about what what your actual uh, costs are, what the, what the total OPEB liability is, how much you guys have set aside for it, and then what your net OPEB liability is. And then I'm sorry, this is page 62. I don't think this is worth. <laughs> And that, that, this is a, a new schedule this year, so as, as years go by, this will uh, grow. You'll see more columns, yes. Okay, I want to go back to budget versus actual. Okay. Is there a schedule of budget versus actual on the um, enterprise funds? No, for financial reporting, you, don't, you would not disclose budget to actuals in your, uh, in your financial statements. Thank you. On that page, does uh, charges for services, does that include water? No. What's in there? Charges for services would be, I'd have to look at the actual detail of the accounts, but it's um, charges for services in your in your financial statements. In the general uh, fund? Yeah, the general fund. It's um, administrative fees for CFD administration, um, charges for recreation classes, um, public works charges, yeah. Development services charges. There's a lot of all, all different fees. kinds of fees that okay. included in there. Yeah, but the this is just the general fund, so any uh, water sewer would be not. Okay. Yeah, quick question: Intergovernmental is that between different municipalities? What is? Uh, intergovernmental would be yeah, it could be some grants. Um, uh, yeah, from other government agencies, Ma mainly the state um, or the federal. I think in this instance, it's probably the state. So uh, earlier, we kind of went through the combining statements uh, for the non-major funds. These were, is where it has the all the individual uh, non-major funds listed, and then the totals are brought uh, to be the total non-major fund. This is all supplementary information. Uh, in a financial statement, the uh, it supplements the basic financial statement. So the detail is back here. The summary is um, in the governmental fund total non-major fund column. Uh, there's also uh, budget to actuals for each of these non-major funds. Um, if, if there's a budget adopted, so some some small funds might not have a budget adopted because. It uh, varies from year to year if you're going to have a grant, if you don't have a grant. Um, so if it, if it does have a fund, uh, a budget adopted, it would be, uh, there would be a budget to actual schedule for these. And um, for, for 
the non-major supplementary information, you're only required to show the final budget and the actual. You don't have to show the original budget. Any questions on those? Uh, internal service funds, uh, beginning on page 91. This is the, uh, the city has several uh, internal service funds for different purposes. The way these funds work is uh, they kind of operate like a business where they are actually charging the other funds within your financial statements, general fund, water fund, um, all the various funds for these services. So um, it, it kind of operates uh, like a business in that sense. And then th this is where it's reported individually and then if you remember on the proprietary fund statement page, we had the one column, which was the total of these internal service funds. These are uh, very, very similar. You know, many, many cities have a, a, an internal service fund for uh, self-insurance, vehicle replacement. Um, it makes it easier to charge the funds to uh, operate activity that all of them are using as opposed to just allocating it uh, to one fund or another. Uh, one of the, um, uh, obviously the biggest, uh, biggest, most significant of these is the self-insured, self-funded insur self insurance fund. Um, this is where it has all of your claims liabilities these are claims that have been made against the city that have been have gone through uh, a third-party claims administrator that determines what the expected or potential exposure could be to the city that they might have to pay out. Um, it's not. These are also estimates, and so um, this is a, a liability that you could potentially have to pay for claims that have been made against the city. It should be noted, it also includes what's called uh, an incurred but not reported claims. So there could have been claims that could still be made um, that occurred prior to the end of June 30, but they weren't actually made as of June 30. And so the city would estimate how much those claims could potentially be and how much they might impact your uh, claims liability. Any questions on those? Is that claims and judgments payable? Is that the estimated one? Yeah, claims and judgments payable. So that's a, that's an estimate. But the one above it is actual claims that are payable. Uh, no. So there's there's a current and then there's a non-current. So the the current is what is potentially expected to be paid out within one year of the reporting date. Okay. So. So the, the 2.3 million is an estimate of what they might expect to be paid out this fiscal year, or in the 18-19 uh, fiscal year. And then the, the other portion is what could be paid out in years and years uh, past that. Any other questions? I number of that page. Hey, thank you. So how do they estimate the uh, non-current liabilities on the claims if the claim hasn't come in yet? Is that based on past history? Or how typically, do they estimate it? Typically, but um, they, can actually, they can actually do it based on actual claims because um, at the time they would know what claims they have that relate to that time period. But typically it would be based off um, previous history. So if, if uh, they estimate that here's our liability at this given time we'll probably get 10 percent of that um, claim against us so it, it is an estimate um, it's, it, the the uh, claims administrators they use kind of their own tables so if it's a specific type of claim they estimate it's going to cost uh, the city fifty thousand dollars it might only cost the city two thousand dollars but they, they estimate it um and and in actuarial accounting and, and in financial reporting um it's conservative so you try to be as conservative as possible so best case scenario it's less than In, in 
terms of establishing the budget, um, can you describe what the process looks like and how citizens have an opportunity to take part in that discussion in terms of like priorities, etc.? Yeah, I, I would not be the one to ask about that. I'm a I'm an auditor, so we, we focus on the financial statements. Um, budget, you probably go to the city oh, management. Okay. Yeah, you, there's no negative disclosures, so you don't disclose things that didn't happen. You don't disclose notes that uh, aren't applicable to you. So it's just, yes. But your partner explained to the council that he does not, that you don't do the same type of audit for each. Each, each agent, each, yeah, right. So the audit you did was nothing that different, <coughs> which should have been different, other than maybe we could have done another city, correct? And each year it could be different. Yeah, well, when, when you, uh, now we're getting into auditing, but uh, <laughs> when you uh, approach an audit or you come into an audit, each agency is different. So you have to, um, you know, do different procedures that you might, you know, each one agency might not have uh, a water fund. So you obviously wouldn't be auditing that. Um, the, the structure of an organization will be different. They might have less people in finance, so there's, you know, uh, one or two people that do a lot more things, so you'd have to do a lot more testing and focus because of the uh, segregation of duties, things like that. Um, in addition, uh, we have to do what's called a risk assessment, where we assess the risk that the financial statements could be materially misstated um, due to uh, fraud or errors, things like that. And so that's that's kind of how we have to approach. Uh, each each line item in your in your financial statements. Well, how could this be misstated? Well, they have these controls in place. We've done uh, testing of your receivables. We've done testing of your payables. Testing of your uh, cash accounts. Your uh, liabilities. Things like that. So it does vary from from agency to agency. And at the end of your audit, you found no indications of actionable fraud. Correct. <laughs> Yeah, we, we didn't. If, if well, if we if we did identify fraud, we would be required to report it. Yes. So the number was not. We right. did not identify fraud. Okay. Material so, to. Well, he just described. Is that considered a forensic audit? Because I hear different, like your audit, forensic audit. Yeah, so this this is a, a financial statement audit. So we are auditing the financial <laughs> statements that management has prepared. So we're auditing the amounts and the disclosures in the financial statements, and part of that we have to assess that they could be materially misstated due to fraud or errors. And so fraud is a huge word um, that, that people throw around, but um, we're not doing a forensic audit. We're not doing a, a fraud audit or, or you know whatever the term might be. We're doing, it's once a year? The, the financial statement audit is, is uh, done on an annual basis. Yes. Thank you. Yes. In your audit, I know it's only been one year, but having done your assessment of the city and how it's run, how would you say our financial health is and whatever information that you're available in terms of how our uh, prospectus looks going forward? Yes, as far as financial health, I think that would be probably more up to management and also council to assess, you know, are, where we want, are, are we where we want to be, uh, you know, are we heading in the right direction? Uh, we don't do prospectus, so we don't, we don't do a whole lot of looking forward uh, unless there would be, uh, you know, significant concerns that, you know, next year wouldn't, you know, be good. But uh, you know, just looking at, uh, we will evaluate. Um, you know, what is your fund, what does your fund balance look like? Does it, you know, are you are you able to pay your bills? Are you able to? Uh, do you have a fund balance available? So. So if these were significant concerns that we had as we looked at that, we would have brought it and reported it to uh, city council. More specifically, do we have the minimum reserves that believe there's a standard, uh, some sort of threshold that we should uh, you know, achieve to just make sure we have... That yeah. the city has established a minimum yeah, threshold? Sort of a yeah, yeah. yeah I think do we need that? Have yeah, you guys have, have, have met that yeah. reserve. Right. Yeah. Exceeded, I think. Yeah, exceeded. Right, so we're like 21.6, 4.1. What's the minimum, by the way? 12.8. So, so the minimum you're, you're referring to is um, what uh, council uh, has established through ordinances or, or resolutions for what they have decided to be their minimum. 
in the, in the auditing world, you know, as far as what we're auditing, we don't, we don't, there's not a, a minimum. You have to have this. So that's not really, um, you know, for us to say what the minimum is. The minimum would be whatever your, your council has chosen to be. And as a guideline, you mentioned best practices. Yeah, best, best practices. Right. So best practices was, yeah, and, and say, three months? Uh, yeah, best, best practices, that's the GFOA's best practices would be two months reserves in your general fund. Mm -hmm. They don't really go into all the other funds, but um, so you kind of have to assess the fiscal health. Um, and we have five, you said five. Five what? Months. Yeah, yeah, just, you know, on, on first glance, you have uh, about four, 14 million in um, unrestricted uh, fund balance. It's a dubious number, isn't it? Yes. During the cap audit, uh, you brought up that there was a 1.1 million dollar uh, error that the county pulled out. During this, would that have been caught normally? During the audit? Yeah, during the cap work, would would your firm have seen or had access to knowing that the city got ripped off by the county by $1.1 million, or would that have gone unnoticed? Yeah, uh, so we actually get reports from the county from what they actually paid you guys, paid the city. So we will we will verify that if the city says that they paid, or the county paid this amount, we verify that that's what the city has recorded, so we confirm those. They didn't actually pay it, so we, they didn't get it. Um, we don't actually test that the county is doing their calculations correctly to, you know, pay the city the appropriate property taxes. Um, I don't know any auditors that would actually do that. that. That's, I mean, the county's auditors would be actually, you know, testing that. But um, the city actually identified that they did not get that money because they had been. Uh, expecting to get it and they didn't receive it. So, so that would potentially would not have been caught through your process, through the capper. It was done internally through the city. Yes, it, that was intended internally. It could have been in the way that, like, a budget. Yeah, the budget to actual, that they, would have been a way where we would have said, said, hey, why, why is this variance so big? And that would be a key to them that something's, you know, give us an explanation and we would dig into it and say, you know, this is what we found. We should have got this from the county, and they didn't give it to us. So there, there was potential. Yeah, Ma management was already aware of it um, yeah. when, we, when we came out to the car. And what was the? Uh, they took one point, or they didn't pay one point one. What was the <coughs> number that was supposed to be paid? The one point one. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. See, the way what happened with the county was there was a negotiation for a specific percentage, but there were. I wasn't there, so I don't know, but I'm assuming there weren't particulars. And they just said, here's your your um, uh, secured ad valorem property, property tax. Secured ad valorem property tax. So that number times the percentage gives us the money that the county needs to keep. But then they took that percentage and they applied it to our trailer coach license fees, our redevelopment redistribution. They were applied it to everything across the board, and that wasn't our agreement. Our agreement was this percent of this item, but how their system sets up, it doesn't take this percent of this one, it takes this percent of everything, but that wasn't our agreement. So we started in like April or May determining that this happened, and it took until December for the county to go to their board and approve, or the fire district to approve the fact that we need to change the percentage because if you're going to hit it across the board, then you need to lower the percentage because we agreed on this dollar amount and you took that dollar amount plus. So we're, they approved it in January, December, and then our council had to approve the exchange. special tax exchange and now we're waiting for the money. And this was all based on the fire department, give, the yeah. Upland fire department being given away, correct? When the it was change the was made. was part of the LAFCO process. Thank you. Any right. right. questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
filled out some survey forms, so if you could please fill them out and leave them at the back, we'd love to hear your feedback. Our workshops can only get better with your input, so thank you for that in advance. And uh, if you signed, up, signed in when you got here, we have uh, your email address if you opted in. We'll notify you of future workshops as well. Thank you so much for coming and for caring about the city of Evelyn. We hope to see you on March 20th when we talk about the brownout. Thank you. Thank you.